On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. To discover the best in events and performances, visit BlumenthalArts.org. I feel that I'm blessed to be a leader and a physician to make a difference, and I feel that I have a calling to support um, not only the city of Charlotte, but to support the whole world, because I do not see that those things that divide us, I don't see them as, I mean, I just see our community and I see our world as, as one world, a world where we can all recognize each other as brothers and sisters, as human beings, and I think that what I'm seeking to do is to be a leader that helps to connect us and bring us together and support all of us in our community, no matter our background or our economic situation. Charles Thomas seeks to create a more beautiful and connected world. He is a program director for the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. In his role, he invests in journalism, in the arts, and in the success of the city of Charlotte. Charles is the former founding executive director of Queen City Forward, a hub for social entrepreneurs. He is also a professional photographer and artist who earlier in his career served as director of education for the Light Factory Contemporary Museum of Photography and Film. In this episode, we talk to Charles about his work investing in the city of Charlotte and the world he feels called to create. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Charles, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. You are the program director for the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation mm -hmm. in Charlotte. That sounds like a very cool job. Uh, it is a cool job. Um, what I get to do is I get to give away money uh, every day to nonprofits and to uh, really interesting ideas that help to advance our community or support the arts or journalism in our city. What is the Knight Foundation? So the Knight Foundation is a foundation that was started by... John and Jack Knight, um, who were publishing men who had newspapers back in the day. And they left their estate to a scholarship fund that became the Knight Foundation. And the mission of the Knight Foundation is to inform and engage the community and to use that as a way to advance democracy in our cities. And so Knight Foundation gives money away to all the cities that Knight Publishing Company was in where the Knight newspapers were. And so we're in 26 cities, and eight of those cities have a program director such as myself. What is the conversation Knight is having about journalism and freedom of the press? Wow. Um, we're having some very interesting conversations around journalism. Um, one is around the transition of journalism to the digital age, ensuring that we have good business models. The other conversation is around the concept of fake news and trust in journalism. Um, that's a challenge for our, our country right now. Um, and it's a big worry for us, um, ensuring that we have good journalism because we think it's crucial to ensuring that we have a strong democracy. Um, as it relates to freedom of speech, that's one of the core tenets of the Knight Foundation is to support um, freedom of speech. Uh, we actually have a significant investment in New York um, that has funded a law center that protects the freedom of speech at Columbia University. And so um, it is a core tenet of the Knight Foundation. It was a core tenet of um, the Knight Brothers and their publishing company. Behind the scenes, what's the conversation? I mean, I, I would say that the conversations around supporting journalism, around how do we ensure that there's trust in the media. It's around ensuring that our citizens are informed and engaged around some of the issues that affect their community. So those are the kind of the core conversations that we talk about at Knight Foundation when we gather and we meet. Uh, and so and that's why you'd see our investments are to support um, new journalism and its, and its transition to the digital age and to support um, innovative business models that support providing information to our community. Bring us to that table. Is there a tension in the discussion? Are there ideas that are in conflict with each other? Is there a debate that's going on? What is the conversation at the table? 
So there's a lot of debate that's going on. There's a great conversation around um, what has worked, what has not worked. Um, there's a good conversation around uh, some of the challenges that the journalism business has faced, um, some of the, the lack of risk-taking, the lack of embracing change, and, um, and talking about some of the, um, the failures that has been in, around journalism. Um, so it's, it's always a rich conversation with some very experienced journalists that are in the room. So most of uh, a good portion of Knight Foundation staff come from a, a, a journalism background, so they have a good experience. But what's interesting about Knight Foundation is that we're seeking to be innovative and to embrace technology. And so our work is, is usually about uh, supporting the, in, the institutions that we support, helping them to see the value of technology and helping them to use that in a way to expand their business model to ensure that we have information that's flowing to, um, to our citizens. What is Knight excited or enthusiastic about right now? So Knight Foundation has investments in journalism, arts, um, innovation, and what I do, which is to focus on advancing communities and cities. And so I would say on a national level, we're excited about doing surveys to research the trust that individuals have in, in the media. We've also made some really interesting investments to look at um, the ethics behind artificial intelligence, um, because one of the conversations we talk about is, is who is who is making the news and who is in control of the distribution of information in our society. And so one of the, the interesting things to consider is the, the role of social media or of, of technology companies and that their influence on our community in providing information is greater than it's ever been. And so it's crucial to ensure that the creators of information or, or the distributors of information are representative of our community are, and are taking into consideration the impact of their platforms on citizens on pushing information and, and keeping our citizens engaged. Well, that's not something I've heard a lot about, the interaction or interface between artificial intelligence and journalism. Can you talk more about that? Well, I mean, if you think about like Twitter and Facebook um, and some recent challenges we've, we've had in the news, you know, so Twitter, there's currently these, these things called bots that, have, that are being used, um, particularly on Twitter, that are able to push information. And, and they're not actual people. They're actually algorithms that have been created to do a particular purpose. And so as we think about artificial intelligence, um, we, it's, it's crucial that we think about who is building that artificial intelligence and how is that artificial intelligence kind of working and operating. So you think about there was a couple of, a few months ago or, or a couple of years ago, um, there was an incident where a Twitter bot, after being created, kind of watched and observed the interactions of of folks on social media, and then um, began to send out its own tweets, and it began to send out tweets that were racist. And it's because it had learned from the way that um, people speak on Twitter or how people speak on Facebook and began to kind of replicate that. And so that's, uh, that's a kind of a scary thought, you know, thinking about robots that incorporate some of our um, least like characteristics, like racism, um, and imagining a machine having control or making decisions um, is something that we need to think about as we continue to explore artificial intelligence. And there really hasn't been a really good conversation around the ethics of artificial intelligence. Who's creating it and what's inside of that person that's creating that AI and how will that impact our society? Is Knight imagining a day where computers are covering the news and making editorial choices? Wow, that's a great question. I, I believe that our CEO, Alberto, has thought about that and, and is imagining a day where there'll be fewer people making those kind of decisions, that things will be automated. Um, and I think it's something that we, we have to really think about and kind of think in an, in an advanced way and in a forward way about how things may turn out. And, um, and so I think Knight Foundation has been really um, thoughtful about this. And I believe that our CEO, Alberto Barguin, has been forward thinking and ensuring that we're, you know, we're thinking about all the different ramifications of artificial intelligence and what, it may, what impact it may have on our society as it relates to information. When you sit at the table and are part of these discussions at night about journalism and freedom of the press and community engagement. What is top of mind for you? Well, top of mind for me is, is the city that I represent, which is Charlotte. Uh, thinking about how these conversations might impact our city and thinking about what are some things that I can bring back to our city to ensure that we're, we're pushing forward, that we're, we're on the curve, on the edge of being connected to technology and to innovation. And so I'm always listening to those conversations and thinking about how they may impact and what are some creative things that we can do in Charlotte to um, that, that represents that conversation. What is a typical day of a program director? <laughs> um, a typical day is um, full of meetings, um, usually back-to-back -back meetings with individuals that, are, that have really cool ideas that, um, for um, making our city better. 
Uh, so there's, there's multiple conversations. There's sometimes checking in on some programs that we've invested in. Program Directors Day may consist of writing a grant that advances um, their strategy or their mission in their particular city. What makes for a good grant application from people who are seeking funds from you? Huh, that's a really good question. Um, what makes for probably a good application is, or a good pitch is really the first step is for the applicant to understand the focus of Knight Foundation. To understand the focus of Knight Foundation nationally and to understand the focus of Knight Foundation within their cities. And so a good grant would incorporate um, and, and have an understanding of what our focus is. And I would recommend that a grantee, that a person writing a grant, would have a conversation with the program director before they write a grant. Um, because it's important to understand the strategy. Because even though you may write a grant that appears to be on the strategy for Knight Foundation, it may not be in the, in the, may not be in the focus area of that particular program director, or it may not be a crucial component to their portfolio. Um, so that's one of the interesting things that I've learned about Knight Foundation as a program director is, you know, when I first thought about the role, I thought it was just an easy role where you just gave away money to, you know, really cool ideas. I didn't understand that there was a, a strategic focus around each foundation and around what each program director is doing. So it's crucial for a grantee to have a relationship with their program director, to have a relationship with Knight Foundation, and to understand where it's headed and what it's trying to accomplish and to present a proposal that helps um, Knight Foundation accomplish, accomplish its goals that it's laid out in its strategy. There is a strategic direction for Knight nationally, and then there is a strategy for each Knight city. Correct. What is the strategy for Charlotte? So the strategy that we're focused on here in Charlotte is about designing and building places and spaces that foster equity, inclusion, and economic mobility. So we're specifically working in a particular neighborhood in Charlotte, outside of downtown Charlotte, called the Historic West End. And we're, help, we're helping that neighborhood, which is going through transition, we're helping to transition that neighborhood to be a more mixed-income, mixed-use, transit-oriented neighborhood that's connected to downtown Charlotte. So in Charlotte, our objective is to create more mixed-income neighborhoods so that it fosters, it creates more mixed-income schools, and it helps to support economic opportunity and, econ and increasing economic mobility in our city. What are the challenges that you are encountering? Uh, well, the challenges that um, probably all program directors encounter, but I'm encountering particularly, is, is that we're dealing with the momentum and the inertia of how things have been done in the past. So in our city, in Charlotte, Charlotte is very, has a strong business orientation. And development is, and the growth that we're having is very, is, is very much based upon thinking about how, what's the best way to make money or make a profit. What the opportunity is in Charlotte is to help developers and city planners to think about how their investments and what they build can, has an impact on supporting people having better access to, to helping to grow their families, to growing their income, helping to create opportunities for communities to grow and for individuals to grow, particularly communities that have been kind of left out of uh, our economic growth in our city. The interesting thing in Charlotte is that we have such tremendous growth, but we have a big divide in wealth. What do you like about your job? Uh, what I like about the job is um, I love the conversations that I have. I like the partnerships. I like the idea of having a strategy so you have a situation where you're, you're working to ch kind of change a community. And, and that's what's most exciting about this role is that uh, I have an opportunity to influence the direction of our city. And, and I'm excited about that because I'm excited about the opportunity that it creates um, for more of our residents in our community. Is there a particular grant that you've given recently that you are excited about? Hmm. So a grant that Knight recently provided in our city is to fund conversations across the city. It's called On the Table, and it's basically funding individuals or organizations hosting a conversation over dinner or over lunch or over breakfast. And I'm extremely proud of it because it's, it's, it led to 5,000 people across our, our community and our county having conversations around what the challenges are in our community and what, the, some of their solu what are some of the solutions. And what I really enjoyed about the, the project and the program is that it puts the, the onus on the individual. It gives you an opportunity to host a conversation. And it gives people a chance to become engaged in trying to solve the, the problems in our community. And there are rarely times where a city or an organization gives individual residents an opportunity to chime in on what they think is important, what they think will help advance our city. So I was very proud of that grant that we made to have on the table here in Charlotte, and I think it's going to help inform our leadership around what are some of the, where the community is, what the community is concerned about, and what are some of the directions we should take. 
one criticism on the table might be that it's conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to put your finger on outcomes. Could the money have been better spent elsewhere? Uh, I think that, number one, it, it was not a very expensive program for what we were able to achieve. So 5,000 folks were able to participate. I'd like to, to challenge the idea that a conversation um, does not lead to action. I think the first step is to have a conversation. I think it's crucial that we, we, we have conversations with people we don't know. Um, and what I found from hosting it on the table myself, I did it with my neighbors, um, neighbors who I did not know beforehand. I, I recently moved into my neighborhood about a year ago and have not formed relationships with um, my neighbors. And so I invited them to a dinner and I invited them to answer questions around what's challenges, challenging us most in our community. And I, I was pleasantly surprised by the conversation. We had an elder who could talk about schools back in her day when she grew up in segregated times. And we had a guy that works in, uh, in fraud that was talking about how he volunteers at, at a school that's not even in our neighborhood. And then what we, what we left the conversation with, um, it, was, it was a great conversation. It allowed us to get to know each other, but we walked away with an idea, and that idea is to form a neighborhood organization because we realized that we didn't have a mechanism for our voices to be heard in our community. So that's just one example of one conversation. And what people do with that conversation, it's up to them. But what we've done is we've given them an opportunity to become engaged. We've given them an opportunity to host a conversation, and I think the next step is up to them is what they do. Um, but I think it's a great way for people to have a conversation, for it to bubble up to civic leadership. And then I think it begins to deepen the opportunities to engage in the future and, um, and later. I know I'm fired up to, build a, to start a neighborhood organization in my community. So, Charles, you are funding projects using Knight Foundation monies aligned with the Knight strategy. If you were funding projects using your own monies, what would you fund? Oh, my goodness. So if it was my own money, and this is a, in, a, in a world where I'm a millionaire billionaire, my choice of, uh, of funding would go towards supporting our public school system. Uh, I think schools are, the, are, are the, the institutions that can help um, improve people's lives. And I think if we have really good quality schools for everyone, we would see that people would be able to advance themselves and, to, and it would allow us to take advantage of the human capital that we're kind of you know, leaving behind, um, human capital that we end up having to pay for later in the future. And I think that a good investment in our schools and creating schools that really support individuals and helping them to, to live their dreams and to understand their own personal strengths and to give people high self-esteem as they learn basic skills, I think would be crucial and I think would change the way, you know, change our country and potentially change the world. If someone from the community came to you with an idea that would address the problem that you just identified, is that something the Knight Foundation could fund? Unfortunately, no. Uh, so Knight Foundation does not invest in, in schools. We make investment, as I mentioned before, in journalism, arts, and innovation, and based upon the strategy of each city. But Knight Foundation has, um, has drawn a line in some of the areas where it would invest because we have limited, uh, believe it or not, limited amount of money. And so the amount of money that we have we're, we're trying to be strategic with it. And with the amount of money that we have in Charlotte to invest, the, the amount that we have to support the school system would, would, re, would be less than a drop in a bucket. And we, and we feel would not be able to make a significant change in the school system. And so that's why Knight um, does not invest in education. What do you want to get better at at your job? Oh, man. I want to get better at, at writing. I want to get better at being a thought leader for our community. I want to get better at building relationships that can advance our strategy and our mission. I'd, I'd like to get better at balancing time. I'd like to have more time so that I could spend researching and getting and connecting to more people that can help to advance our city. Those are a few of the things. Charles, in your LinkedIn profile, you do not describe yourself as a program director. Instead, you describe yourself as an artist, educator, and social entrepreneur. How are you an artist? So. I am a photographer, um, so I have recently, a few years ago, published a photography book on black philanthropy, which is now a traveling exhibit, and I've been a photographer since, I think, the late 90s, uh, so I'm, I love taking pictures. I love taking pictures that preserve the history and heritage of our community, and I really enjoy taking pictures that are positive images of African Americans, in particular African American men, so it's an opportunity to allow me to explore a subject as well as an opportunity for me to kind of advance and project a message. How does thinking of yourself as an artist and being a photographer 
inform your work as a program director for night? So as a photographer, um, I'm creative, uh, and I like to sometimes do things in a non-traditional way. And it really support, helps me as a program director because I really can connect to the artists that Knight Foundation supports. I think I have a, a good, a relatively good understanding of our arts ecosystem and what some of our needs are. Um, and so I, it's, it's great to kind of have a background in arts because it makes it easier to talk to some of the artists that we fund. And it also kind of helps me in terms of and the work that I do in terms of helping me to stay creative. I think about what photographers do in terms of what's in the frame and what's not in the frame, mm -hmm. what you focus on, what you don't focus on. In some ways, don't you do that as well as a program director, choosing what's in the frame and what you focus on? Yeah, that's a really good analogy. Um, we have to be very strategic. It's unfortunately, uh, again, in this job, I thought it was just about giving away money. Um, it's unfortunate that we have a limited amount of money. And we also have a limited amount of time. Um, and that's been an interesting challenge for me because I'm used to being a, an executive director or working for a nonprofit. Um, so we have to be very, we have to make sure that we're putting the right things in the frame so that we're, we're um, painting or developing the picture um, and the vision, uh, enacting a vision that we want for Charlotte. So we have to be very strategic with where we invest our money and our time in order to achieve our goals. Is there anything frustrating you right now in your job? I think, let's see. What I'd say is um, what's frustrating with my job that I did not expect is that and when it comes to um, making a grant or supporting a particular initiative, Knight Foundation has a really, um, has, I don't know, necessarily want to call it bureaucratic, but it has uh, a structure where they question your ideas and question the projects that you're putting forth. And so getting used to that process when I'm used to kind of just doing stuff as an executive director versus having to kind of rework it, tweak it, rework it, even though I've done that in my life for different things, to do that around a project or initiative is just an interesting piece and sometimes takes a little longer than I'm used to doing things. I think probably what's also been challenging is when um, you're part of an organization and just as you asked me that question, what would I invest my money in? So I would invest in education. So to be a part of a foundation where I thought a foundation in a certain level supported charities and nonprofits and supported good causes, if you see a good cause and as a foundation leader, as a program director, if it's outside of the scope of your foundation, it's, it's challenging, it's, it's tough to not be able to invest in that. It's tough to not be able to support that initiative. So um, it's not my money. It belongs to Knight Foundation and it belongs to, to the brothers who left the, their, their estate um, to the endowment. Um, so that's sometimes frustrating, not being able to just take action as quickly as I like to and as quickly as I'm used to. Do you feel hindered by the review process? No, actually. I mean, I think um, early on I, was, I felt hindered. It's something that I've had to learn. I'm two years into the role, and I'm actually just now going through these review processes. And I think they can help to improve a project and ask really good questions. And so um, I think it's actually a good process, and I think there's room to grow and to, to change it. But, um, but I think overall it helps to make um, a program director better and helps to make your grant and project better. What do you know now about yourself that you didn't two years ago when you started the job? Uh, I have a desire to have a really strong team. And what's interesting about this role is that we work separately in our cities and we're disconnected from the Miami office. And so that makes it really hard to, have, to be on a team where it's a team of individuals that work in different cities. And so what's kind of emerged for myself is realizing how valuable, how much I value being a part of a, a team and a network that's uh, working to achieve goals. And so that's come out in some of the work that I've been doing at Knife Foundation where I've actually helped to lead our department in developing strategies and ways to, to improve our teamwork. Charles, I'm curious as to the life that you've led, how you grew up and, and became the man that you are now. I'd like to ask it about your life through the lens of photography. If I, saw, if I saw photographs of your home and neighborhood when you were a child, what would I see? So uh, if you saw photographs of, of the neighborhood that I kind of remember most, which is the Greer Heights neighborhood here in Charlotte, you would see an all-black neighborhood. You would see um, what would some call uh, public housing. Uh, you would see um, uh, a lot of apartment building living. 
Um, you might see a, a grocery store that's within walking distance of my apartment that is kind of like a convenience store type grocery store, which is the grocery store in the neighborhood. Uh, you would see kids playing. Um, you might see some kids, um, when I was growing up, playing in a creek. Uh, we spent a lot of time outside. Some would say that if you looked at this picture, you might see um, a photograph of a poor neighborhood. Uh, and that just depends on your interpretation of the image and what image is taken. You'd see me walking to my elementary school. And you'd see me playing with my friends outside. you see me fighting bullies. Uh, you see all kinds of things that um, I think is sometimes typical to, to most kids growing up. You mentioned public housing. Did you grow up in public housing? Uh, yeah. So uh, my mom and I, um, when I moved into um, Greer Heights when I was in fifth grade, it was a, a public housing um, apartment complex um, and it was just me and my mom she was a single mom um, and we lived there for about five or six years brothers or sisters no brothers or sisters only child what was that like for you it was it turned out to be cool I think there were times that I really wanted a brother or sister to play with probably more of a brother than a, than a sister but as I look back on it um, I have a great relationship with my mom we were very close and I think it allowed me to and now as I have a family of five <laughs> Um, I kind of miss sometimes having my own space and I miss, or I'm not used to sharing different things. So as I look back on it now, I think it was actually really, really good that I, I grew up without siblings. How are you like your mom? Hmm, how am I like my mom? So, um, so I'm like my mom and my family in that we're pretty peaceful. Most, a lot of my family, um, they've been teachers. Uh, and so my mom and I are similar. We look similar. I think was similar in how we were kind of laid back. Um, my mom is sometimes also called upon to be a counselor, and I think I've played that role at different times. And so, um, so yes, yeah, so I've got a lot of, and kind of go with the flow kind of nature. And as well, the way that I'm like my mom is that my mom was a steady hard worker. Um, she um, supported us and supported me and was also a really kind of cool mom where she wasn't really dictatorial had all these rules she was really she was kind of growing up with me actually um, and it led for it allowed us to kind of to have a really good relationship um, and to stay connected um, and she gave me a lot of room to grow and she was she's always been supportive of me and so I'm very proud of my my sons as well do you find yourself raising your children like your mom raised you uh, I think so at times I think I have those moments where I'm like that's what my mom uh, said to me but yeah, I, I think um, raising them in a similar fashion, um, giving them a little, I'm probably a little harder <laughs> than my mom is. I have all boys, I have three boys. I'm very loving towards them and support them, um, but also hold them to certain standards. You didn't mention a father. No, so um, it was just me and my mom growing up. My father, uh, my mom and dad were married for about a year and they got a divorce. Um, and once they were divorced, um, my father was no longer in the picture or in my life. And so, um, so I grew up without him. And it was interesting when you asked that question about a photo of your life, uh, of, your, of your old neighborhood, it made me think of a photography assignment that I did where it was self-portraiture and I uh, created a, a conversation with my father. I've, I have like one picture of him of when he was like 10 years old. And so I did these self-portrait images of me and this picture of him kind of telling a story of kind of my connection or lack of connection to him. Have you had any connection or in, uh, interaction with him as an adult? No. Charles, do you ever want your father to know who you are now? No, I, I haven't. So uh, I kind of came to grips with my father in my throughout my life. I mean, I think in my early 20s and then around my 30s, um, I did a lot of research around what does it mean to be a man because I, I didn't feel like he was around. I didn't feel like I understood what that was. And so I think him not being around really has made me who I am today, has made me a good father because I wanted to be a, a better father than him. But I also just really appreciate that he gave me life, you know, and also that he left <laughs> because, I mean, my image of manhood is not skewed by someone that didn't know who they were. And that's my assumption uh, or skewed by someone who, who wasn't confident in who they were. I had to create my own image. And so sometimes that's been a challenge. It's been a real challenge. But at other times, it's allowed me to connect and meet people that I probably would not have met and has made me into the man that I am today. So I don't, you know, I used to think that I'd want to go and find him and for him to see me. And I only, I, when I was a kid, I always wanted that. I wanted him to show up and give me a lot of gifts. But as I was older, I realized that I didn't really need that connection. Um, and so 
I've let it go. And if I happen to meet him, cool. What did those years growing up in Greer Heights teach you? What do you value as a result? I value school. Um, so growing up in Greer Heights was at times challenging. Um, and I think it, it also motivated me because I didn't necessarily like um, where I was in the neighborhood. Um, I also didn't like the fact that we didn't have a lot of money. So very early on, I realized that I wanted to, to make money. Um, I felt that was a way to kind of control my life. And then for me to succeed in Greer Heights, I, was not, I, I didn't play a lot of sports, but what I was good at was school. And so I, I gained a strong appreciation for school and academics. Um, I had a, a strong appreciation for the friends that I made at school who, who didn't necessarily live in my neighborhood. And I knew, and it made me um, kind of competitive. I knew I wanted to have what a lot of my friends who were wealthier had. And so it made me work hard in school, and it also has made me work hard in work because I'm constantly kind of competing with myself and competing with them to ensure that I have the resources I need to succeed. You started your own photography company, Sankofa Photography, and from there you became director of education at the Light Factory. What were those years like? So those are some really fun years. Um, that was an opportunity for me to grow a photography business as well as grow a business providing education and photography training to elementary school students. And then at the Light Factory, I was able to expand the work that I was doing um, in schools and in the community uh, to a position that allowed me to not only teach in the classroom, but to hire other photographers to teach students photography and to teach them from kindergarten all the way up to high school. After the Light Factory, you applied to become the founding executive director of Queen City Forward. What was Queen City Forward and why were you interested in it? So Queen City Forward is a hub and at times an incubator, an accelerator to support social entrepreneurs in Charlotte. So I was interested in this um, because I was inspired by Muhammad Yunus, who is the founder of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, who was the first person that I read about um, that helped me to understand this concept of social entrepreneurship, which is, means having a business that not only makes a profit, but helps to support people and the planet. Uh, and so I was inspired by reading uh, Muhammad Yunus's book, Banker for the Poor, because it helped me to bring together my desire to make money with my desire to um, do good in the world. You had to start an organization from scratch. What was that like? Oh, man, starting a Queen City Forward from scratch was, was quite the challenge. It was it was, it, was, it, was, it was really hard, um, but at the same time, it was, um, I can't describe it. It's like you're very much alive. It's like you're, you're like, you know that anything, that if you don't do things right, it could be like the end of you. I don't know if it means you're closer to death or what, but it's kind of exhilarating. It was, it was incredible to start something and to have a little bit of resources and a little bit of recognition that allowed us to build Queen City Forward's brand and our programming. And it was, it was an exciting time. It was a lot of fun. And it is really interesting. It's really cool to run your own business, to be in your own business, because everything that you do or everything that's done is a reflection of, of your work or of my work. And so it was it was a great time. I enjoyed it. And it was it allowed me to, again, bring together my passion of, of running a business to as well as having a positive impact on the city. Is there a particular memory you have of, at QCF that sort of represents your time there? Yes, um, I do have a memory. Um, I have a memory of a llama, bringing a llama to UNC Charlotte um, Center City campus. Um, it was the demo day or pitch day for our college entrepreneurship program. Um, and we had seven uh, college entrepreneurs who were really talented individuals. And one of those individuals had a business where they were converting llama fur into the stuff that goes inside of sleeping bags. And they really they thought it'd be interesting if we brought a llama to, to pitch day. And we did. Um, and it made for some great photographs and some great conversations with the mayor of Charlotte. How long were you at QCF? I was at Queen City Forward for about four and a half years, I think. You then applied to become program director of Knight. What attracted you to this role that you currently have? So what attracted me to Knight Foundation are things that were attractive to me at Queen City Forward. Uh, I felt that Knight Foundation had made some really interesting investments in Charlotte and innovation, as well as I noticed that they made investments in entrepreneurship. They didn't seem like a typical foundation or nonprofit. They seemed like they were an organization that valued creativity and, grab and valued pushing the envelope of things. And so I was honored um, to apply for the position. And I was honored to be accepted because I think Knight Foundation in our city, in Charlotte, plays a pivotal, pivotal role in helping to push our city to be creative and innovative. 
Uh, just over a year ago in the city of Charlotte, uh, we had protests in the streets about the shooting of Keith Lamont Scott by a uh, Charlotte police officer. You wrote an article published in Charlotte Agenda entitled, Charlotte, There is a Way Forward Together. Do you remember the article? I do, I do. How would you summarize it? Uh, basically, in the article, I was saying that there's a way, f- a way forward by us stopping individuals and having conversations with strangers, as well as taking time to understand um, some of the, the history um, in our city, behind our city, as it relates to, to race. And I recommended that folks attend a race equity workshop led by Race Matters for Juvenile Justice to learn about institutional racism and systemic racism to help understand, uh, for people to understand what, what caused the unrest in our city. Charles, could you read this paragraph? It's something you wrote. Sure. Ask questions of someone different from you, preferably someone who makes you uncomfortable. Maybe it's someone of a different ethnicity or economic background. Maybe it's a protester or someone in law enforcement. Ask him or her how they are processing what's happening. Ask how they're feeling. Ask what their hopes are. We all may be surprised. I'd like to ask you those questions. All right. How are you processing what happened in Charlotte? Um, uh, I, pro- I mean, it, um, hmm. So a lot of people were shocked by the unrest in Charlotte, and I wasn't shocked. I was surprised that it happened because this is a city where things of that nature don't usually occur. But on a, and, and then on the second level, on a, another level, and this may sound interesting, but I was really proud of our city for taking a stand. I was really proud of those who took to the street, of the community organizers that organized it, and who continue to organize in our city because it's a voice that has not been heard in our community. Um, We are a city of large corporations and large institutions, and we're not a city of grassroots movements. And I think grassroots movements are what help to ensure that a community is changing and is supporting the least of us in our community are supported. And I think it's crucial that grassroots movements and community organizers protest in our city because sometimes that's the only way for people to realize how challenging it is for some members of our community. What are your hopes for the city? Uh, My hope for our city is that we um, become a city that, at this point, we're a city that is challenged by economic mobility. And I hope we become a city that can live the vision, the dream of economic opportunity, a city that provides opportunity for all of its citizens. I um, have a vision of Charlotte having really good schools for every child in our city, and that those schools help to produce some really smart and connected individuals that feel like they have a place in our community. So my hope for our city is that we focus on our challenges and that we are bold in creating solutions to close the gap as it relates to wealth and income and access, um, and that we work to create a city that supports those of us that are actually, that have the least opportunity and least connection in our city. Charles, I'd like to talk about your own calling, your own sense of destiny, if you will, your, your own sense of your life and what contribution you can make during your time here. How do you think of yourself? Hmm. I still think I'm the kid that, um, that's living in, a, in a, an economically challenged neighborhood. Um, I think um, where I grew up and um, growing up um, without a father, with a single mom, being African-American very much informs who I am. And I feel like it guides um, my mission and purpose in life, which is to create um, communities that support all of its residents and to help build organizations that help to bring us together. I feel myself, I feel that I'm blessed to be a leader in a position to make a difference. And I feel that I have a calling to support um, not only the city of Charlotte, but to support the whole world. Because I do not see that those things that divide us, I don't see them as I mean, I just see our community and I see our world as, as one world, a world where we can all recognize each other as brothers and sisters, as human beings. And I think that what I'm seeking to do is to be a leader that helps to connect us and bring us together and support all of us in our community, no matter our background or our economic situation. Do you think of yourself being on a much larger stage one day? Yes. What stage might that be? Uh, I'd like to be on a global stage. Uh, I'd like to be a leader um, that helps to bring our community and our world together. I think we have more opportunity with living in harmony than we do living in in war and conflict. And I believe that we can find ways to do that. And I think we can create design and create systems that support that. So that's the role that I'd like to play. 
and what are the possibilities there? Is it public office? Is it thought leadership? Is it a moral figure? Um, I, I don't know. So every time I have a, uh, I put a kind of a name on whatever I want to be, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised with something else, you know? So, um, uh, I've, I tend to try to take advantage of the opportunities that are provide, provided to me and to be grateful for the opportunity that I have. Um, and so I don't know exactly what role that may be, but I'm excited to play a role that helps to support, support our community and supports our world. But you do think of yourself one day as being a global figure? Yes. What sustains you? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think my family sustains me. Looking at my boys and um, looking at my wife, um, they help me to remember what it's all about. And so playing football with my boys is one of the, the coolest things I get to do every weekend. And that gives me life. Seeing my son play soccer is just exciting energy that, that gives me life and, and helps to sustain me. And then I think what sustains me also is, is, is working to create successful projects that helps to bring our community together. When I see folks, when I see folks working together who didn't think they would work together, that's something that inspires me and helps to keep me going um, and gives me hope um, for bringing our world together. Charles, the name of our podcast is On Life and Meaning. When you think about that, what comes to mind and what would you share with our audience? For me, it's about what's important in life is to find a purpose and to find something that motivates you and guides you and gives you passion. Um, I think that's crucial, and I think I've been blessed to do things that I enjoy and do things that help me to feel connected to, to our world and our community. And so when I think of the meaning of life, I think about being connected to ourselves and being connected to the higher power that exists um, and, believing in, and believing in the higher power and believing in our ability to do things that I would say sometimes are, are supernatural. And I think it's possible for us to create and design our world in the way that we want it most. Um, and I invite everyone to look inside and find that purpose, that light that guides you so that you can create the world that you most desire. Thank you for your time today, Charles. Thank you. And now, a personal word. This is what I know about Charles Thomas. He has a larger vision of himself based on a more beautiful and connected world. That world is informed not only by his personal history of growing up in public housing as an African-American young man raised by a single mom, and his adult career choices that has taken him from lucrative work at Anderson Consulting to teaching children photography at a museum, to running his own startup social enterprise, to creating and executing a strategy to build community on behalf of a national foundation, but also by a set of beliefs about how the world we know today could be fundamentally made better. Charles once told me about the ideas of Charles Eisenstein, author of The Ascent of Humanity, Sacred Economics, and The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible. In all his works, Eisenstein makes a simple but profound case that the many political and social and environmental problems we are facing in the world are the result of an underlying worldview he calls the story of separation. Humans have embraced a story that they are separate from each other and from nature. This separation results in people pursuing their self-interest in a zero-sum game of exploitation. Eisenstein talks further about how capitalism and the current monetary system has led to alienation, competition, and a system predicated on continuous growth that is destroying the planet and our souls. A new story is necessary. For Eisenstein, a new story is emerging. He calls the new narrative the story of interbeing, one that offers an entirely different set of answers to the defining questions of life. Elements of the new story include that my being partakes of your being and of all being, that our very existence is relational, that therefore what we do to another, we do to ourselves, that each of us has a unique and necessary gift to give the world, that the purpose of life is to express our gifts, that every act is significant and has an effect on the cosmos, that we are fundamentally connected to each other, to all beings, and to the universe, that every person we encounter and every experience we have 
mirrors something in ourselves. That humanity is meant to join fully the tribe of all life on earth, offering our uniquely human gifts toward the well-being and development of the whole. That purpose, consciousness, and intelligence are innate properties of matter and the universe. Eisenstein speaks of a world in which we have fallen in love with each other as fellow and grace-filled human beings, and we have fallen in love with Earth and the climate and biodiversity that gives us life. When I hear Charles Thomas talk about his vision of a world of greater equity and opportunity, one in which we are connected to each other as human beings, I hear the very clear voice of Charles Eisenstein. But Charles Thomas is not simply echoing ideas. He is living those ideas in the work he is doing and the destiny he is willing to declare about himself. He expects that his service will take him to a global stage. He wants the global stage. That drive will take him far as he seeks to become a historical transformative figure, one that will help usher in the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Those are my words about Charles Thomas, not his words, but I believe Charles sees himself in that way. A longer conversation with Charles would reveal this. He has done the work of reflecting deeply on who he is and who he wants to be. He is leading and many will follow.